Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, the Obama birth certificate scandal accelerates. America's toughest sheriff, Joe Arpaio, and his chief investigator, Mike Zullo, talk to InfoWars about the media blackout surrounding Obama's fraudulent birth certificate and the growing list of missing records. The majority of politicians don't even want to talk about it, Republicans and Democrats. It's like the plague to talk about this. I've never seen anything like this, and I've been a top federal law enforcement official for years and years. I'm not dropping it. So I'm not dropping this. I'm going to keep moving forward. An InfoWars exclusive report with the Cold Case Posse. <laughs> InfoWars has come down here to Phoenix, Arizona to speak to Sheriff Joe Arpaio and his team, the Cold Case Posse, who are investigating the eligibility of this president, Barack Obama, and his ability to appear on the state ballot. The question of this president's eligibility has been an issue ever since Barack Obama ran for the Democratic Party nomination back in 2008. What's all the fuss about? All the fuss is over a piece of paper, or a PDF to be exact, which was put on the White House website back in April 2011. Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio has put together a cold case posse team of investigators, all volunteers and at no cost to the state, all with law enforcement backgrounds. And what they found during the course of their investigation is shocking. This document contains, according to the team, a number of digital anomalies that can only point at a forgery. What's the significance of this bill today, this legislation that's been introduced this week? Well, I think it's uh, important. It's only common sense uh, using a, a law to uh, uh, pursue, uh, to make sure the person uh, that is running is who that person is. I don't think it's asking too much. Uh, I believe that our investigation probably uh, substantiates the need for this when you look at the evidence that we have accrued in the last six months with our cold case posse, anybody with common sense looking at those two documents that we feel are forged would say, wait a minute, you know, we better get another system going to make sure this doesn't happen again. So it's only common sense, but there's a lot of politics involved. People don't want to even talk about it. You can see there's not many people that showed up here. Everybody wants to ignore this subject, uh, and uh, most of the questions in that press conference on March 1 wasn't about the evidence. They didn't want to talk about that. It's all this has been already done, and, oh, this is old stuff. Why don't they talk about the evidence? Nobody's talking about the evidence, which is very interesting. And there seems to be a, a national blackout on this. I mean, you know, whatever I do, I make national news. When I put people in pink underwear, or, I always make national news. But this one, they don't want to talk to the sheriff. How's the response been from your constituents in general about those who know about this effort? Well, quite frankly, I didn't know how it would work, uh, whether uh, they would be against me, since everybody else seems to avoid the issue. Uh, but it hasn't been as bad as I thought. Uh, I, I don't get many negatives other than these Mickey Mouse threats and garbage through blogs, but the people that I meet, and I meet every day, I'm giving speeches. Hundreds of people a day come up for my picture and so on, but they never uh, say anything bad about what I'm doing on the Obama thing. In fact, a lot of them like what I'm doing. So politically, it hasn't hurt me, but it doesn't matter because I would have done it anyway. But I'm a little surprised at, at the support on this issue, those that are willing to talk about it. Now, all the, the majority of politicians don't even want to talk about it, yeah. Republicans and Democrats. It's like the plague to talk about this. I've never seen anything like this, and I've been a top federal law enforcement official for years and years, and I knew about the Watergate, and I've been through it all. Uh, but i never seen this, this situation. Joe Arpaio is the sheriff of Maricopa County. He represents 4.5 million residents here in Phoenix. 250 concerned residents 
came forward to Joe Arpaio six months ago with concerns about the president's birth certificate and his eligibility to be and run for the highest office in the land. And the Tea Party came to me and asked me to look into it, and I gave it to my volunteer posse made up of ex-cops and attorneys at no cost to the, uh, the taxpayers, and they report to me. I have 3,000 posses, I happen to have a cold case posse, and I told them to look into it. I mean, what's the big deal? And uh, when they did, they did a good job in coming up with a lot of evidence. Uh, so what should I do? Dump it in the wastebasket and forget it? It's incumbent on me when I find suspicious activity. If I can't handle it, give it to other authorities that can, if they will, and not drop it. So I'm not dropping this. I'm going to keep moving forward. How good is this team you've assembled, uh, in your opinion? Well, they're ex-cops. Uh, uh, Mike has done a great job uh, on this, living this for 24 hours a day. And uh, it does just as good if he was full-time. But he's an ex-cop. He just doesn't get paid. But he has the authority under me, under the Constitution. I can swear in private citizens called the posse, and they have the same coverage as a regular deputy. They just don't get paid. So isn't this great? So I can't get all the public to say you're wasting taxpayers' money. I decided to do this right off the bat because the media would be after me. Why are you wasting taxpayers' money? Although right now, at this point of time, I could use regular deputies. We're talking about two possible fraud and uh, forgery cases. This team of investigators has been working on this case since then. And what they have found is extremely revealing and it is unprecedented. We were instructed by Sheriff Arpaio to look at this in an unbiased professional manner. There were no politics involved in this. The onset of this investigation, I told my team that we are here attempting to validate this document. Our attempts to validate the birth certificate document failed relatively early in this uh, venture. Going forward into this document, we began to uncover more and more anomalies that could not be replicated by any test or any standard that we put forth. What that had indicated to us is this document was manufactured, constructed, and presented for a purpose. And that purpose was to deceive. That purpose meant that we had a fraudulent document. Representative Bernal Smith. Thank you. You know, I uh, support this bill, and uh, Carl asked me to come here uh, and st stand behind the sheriff because I, I appreciate what the sheriff has done uh, in regard to this because it took courage to do this. Uh, even though that uh, there's been some accusations by the federal government against him, he then investigated uh, the president of the United States. And he, he provided me with a, a letter that he sent to the uh, director of the uh, Selective Service and he also served me with a copy of Barack Obama's Selective Service Registration Form. And I, I challenge anyone in this room to look at this form and say it's not suspicious. It, it's dated July 29th, 80. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've been a lawyer for 30 years. I've never seen a government official a document that says 80 instead of 1980. This document has some questions, and I, I applaud the sheriff in writing to Director of Selective Service, Romo, and say, give me some answers. But Sheriff, I predict this. I predict in 30 days, would you ask him to give you an answer, he will not answer you. And Sheriff, stay on them, because we deserve the answer, the people of Arizona deserve an answer, and the people of the United States of America deserves an answer to whether or not Barack Obama, uh, Barack Obama is true to his name or is it a phony? That's my comments, and I support this bill. I support Sheriff Arpaio. Thank you very much. If the legislation gets uh, killed for whatever reason this week, you, are you still going to continue with your efforts? And, and what do you see? Where, where is it going next? Next step, for instance, on a, a federal level or so forth? Oh, we're not stopping. Whether it's passed or not passed, we're going to continue doing our job. This would just help us a little. Actually, this was passed last year. The governor vetoed this. 
Okay. So I don't understand, and they, they made it a little milder at this time around, so I don't understand why it can't be passed again. But nobody wants to talk about it, probably because I stuck my nose in it, and I'm kind of coming up with evidence that there's something wrong. You'd think that would make everybody want to do something about it. But everybody wants to keep it, don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Democrats, Republicans, you name it. So what is this, a political year that everybody's afraid to talk about it? Or they don't want nothing done about it? They don't want to face this issue? That's sad. Do you think America asks a lot of the countries around the world to uphold a certain standard of democracy and transparency in their affairs? How important is it for us to have that level of transparency and accountability and integrity here at home? Is that, is that what this represents? I think it's very important. Now, I'm just looking at it as a law enforcement guy. I'm looking at two crimes. I'm not accusing the president of uh, violating any law. What we're looking at is two possible forged government documents. If it was you or anybody else, everybody would be saying, how come you're not arresting this guy? How come you're not doing it? Just because it's the president? It's, nobody wants to touch it? That's sad. So, as I say, we're not accusing the president, but we sure know somebody's responsible for that selected service form and for the birth certificate that they went public and showed. What confuses me is the amateur type of uh, operations they were performing. When you look at the birth certificate, that's sort of amateur. And yet everybody says that uh, that's a legitimate birth certificate. Well, I'll tell you how to solve this. And day one, when I launched this uh, operation, all I said, show me the microfish. Mm -hmm. Show the microfish, and it's all over. Yeah. Where's the microfish in the hospital? Come on. We got two twins born at the same time. So just show us the microfish. Another thing that's suspicious, as I have, sometimes I have a conspiracy theory, is the fact we went to the archives in Washington and looked at all the immigration forms uh, up to uh, August 1, mm -hmm. 1961, and then August 7th, but there's a whole week missing when he was born. Now, is that another coincidence? I can go on and on and on, and yet nobody wants to talk about it. The press reaction to the Ohio cold case posse investigation has been overwhelmingly negative and skeptical. But this doesn't surprise anybody who follows both the mainstream media and the alternative media on any major issue. That's why InfoWars has come down to Phoenix to take a look closer at this investigation and also to speak to the Posse's lead investigator, Mr. Mike Zullo. My name is Michael Zullo. I am the lead investigator for Sheriff Arpaio's Cold Case Posse. Um, I am a former police detective, former private detective, state of Arizona. Uh, I moved uh, to Arizona in 1993, joined the uh, Sheriff's Posse in 2005, and in 2006 the Sheriff asked me to head up a newly formed Cold Case Posse, uh, specifically used for his purpose, and that answered directly to him. When Sheriff Arpaio contacted me, he asked me to come down to his office. Um, he relayed to me that he was petitioned by about 250 citizens asking for help. They believed that their voting rights were going to be infringed, and they suspected that the birth certificate uh, put forth by Barack Obama was, in fact, fraudulent, and they asked him to investigate it. When the sheriff uh, contacted me and I did come down, he explained that to me. He also explained to me that he wasn't really sure if this was in his venue or jurisdiction to look at. So rather than assign a compensated detective or a group of detectives to go on a fishing expedition, he assigned it to us. We are volunteers. We have a law enforcement or investigative background, plus legal background. We have a, a number of attorneys that work with us, and we decided to take on the matter. Um, the sheriff made it very clear to me that he wanted an unbiased, non-political investigation and actually stated to me uh, numerous times that he wanted to clear the president, wanted this issue gone away, and have the country move on. He didn't believe it was good for the country. That's what the mandate. That's how we went and moved forward. When we started to delve into this, we started to look at the April 27th document, 2011, released by the White House, the long form birth certificate. Um, in looking at the document right off the cuff, it was an electronic file. We started to play around with it basically ourselves to get familiar with it. And as fate would have it, I actually came across an Alex Jones 
video demonstrating the way the, the document would be taken apart in layers. Rob, let's go ahead and get to this document. Right. Okay, first thing what we're going to do, here's the article on InfoWars. Obama birth certificate raises as many questions as it answers by Paul Joseph Watson. He's got the birth certificate. You scroll down to the bottom of the article, the whitehouse.gov, Obama's long-form birth certificate, whitehouse.gov. So we're going to click on that. Here's what everybody's been looking at today. Here's the document. We're going to save this into a folder called Obama birth right here. Nothing in here, and here it says birth certificate long form. So now, if you have a copy of Adobe Illustrator, you open that up. So now we're in Illustrator, you can see up at the top here. We're gonna open this really quickly. Here we are in Illustrator, and you can see already that there's little layers, but you can't, it, it moves everything at one layer, okay? So there, I'm gonna go back, put it back here. Now watch this, I'm gonna click onto it, right click to release clipping mask. This is what everybody's been doing. So now. Everything has been uh, broke, all the layers have been broken apart. So we'll just grab this layer real quick and we're going to cut and it. And this is like in a Photoshop Wait, file. Yes. You can see what was moved before yeah. and what they altered. And you can see that these things were cut in here. I'm sorry, go yeah. ahead. So here we are. I'm going to cut this layer. Boom. And now we're going to add it to a different layer on top of that other layer. And now you can see this is a completely different layer. And there is even a missing number on this when you bring this back in. We went to some graphic design experts, um, some forensic document examiners, and we asked their opinion of the document. It became apparent to us and apparent to them that the document was layered, but was layered in such a manner that it could only be put together by human logic, not something that could happen by itself in a software type of setting. In other words, a one-button push isn't going to accomplish what happened to that document. So then during our own testing, we took a scan of the president's long-form birth certificate. As a matter of fact, we printed off a copy by turning off the green safety background, which just simply produced a black and white image on a white piece of paper. Perfect. Perfect. We took that image and we photocopied that onto safety paper. We literally made a hard copy document. We took that document, scanned it into a computer, and we got, lo and behold, a one-dimensional document. You could not move anything on it. There were no layers. There was one link, one layer. Nothing moved. Nothing could be altered. Nothing could be changed. Then we took that same document and we ran it through OCR testing and compression testing. And we got links and we got layers. But we didn't get nine links and we didn't get nine layers. We got anywhere from 45 to 250 layers. We ran it through different type of scanning equipment, different copiers, got the same results. The other thing that became extremely apparent to us was that the register stamp and the date stamp could be moved completely off the document and they would leave a white halo background. That struck me because in the document that we printed out, you had a marriage between the black font ink and the green safety paper. There was no separating this. This, though, left a white halo, almost like a ghosting of, of the information on the stamp. Further analysis showed us that the register stamp and the date stamp were in fact imported to the document from an unknown source document. They were actually 90 degree rotated. They were brought over to the document. They were placed on the document. There are separate little entities residing on the document. We first thought, okay, they just took it and they laid it on the document. Although we weren't able to produce the halo effect or the white ghosting effect. Further investigation revealed to us that what they actually did is they worked with almost like a white pallet or a white sheet of paper, if you will, did all the printing work, put the stamp on it, put the register stamp, the date stamps, and some other date stamps on it. And then what they did is, by computer generation, replicated green safety paper and applied it last to the document, filling in all the white background. When you take it to that step, what happens is, the green safety paper replicated background by computer generation cannot fill in black font. It fills in blank white spaces, doesn't touch any other character. Hence, when you move the document, you get the outline of what was already there. That, to us, was enough to say the document is 100% manufactured, has been manipulated, but worse than that, the register stamp and the date stamp have no legal authority certifying this document to be anything. It is our position the document has no legal authority 
and therefore is not a representation of an accurate certificate of live birth from Hawaii or any other state. People younger than me are a lot better at this than I am. They understand this to a T. This is extremely complicated information. To put one of these together, you can't just be a, a quote, novice. Even though I believe this was poorly done, you cannot be a novice. You have to have an in-depth understanding of the technical aspects of the software and what happens here. People that uh, work with this stuff for a living, graphic experts, what I learned, I didn't know this when it happened, when this document was produced, within 30 minutes, graphic designers were all questioning its authenticity It's because they worked with the software. Digital forensics is a science unto itself, but we also live in a very scary time. You cannot rely on your eyes anymore to believe what you see. Well, this is, first of all, is a law enforcement investigation. It's the first time a duly constituted law, constituted law enforcement agency has said that there is probable cause of fraud in Obama's birth and other identity documents. If we've got somebody in the White House who's got identity fraud at the core of who they are, this is a question that ought to concern all Americans. And this is not going to go away. This issue is only going to deepen. It's only going to increase the suspicion, you know, <laughs> whispering to Medvedev and an international cop. Well, what is this guy? You know, did he ever spend any time in the Soviet Union? Wouldn't even know all the nations he's traveled to. What was he doing in Pakistan? You know, how, where did Obama's passport come from? Did he use an Indonesian passport to go to Pakistan? Was his mother in the CIA? What did he do working for a CIA front? There's only questions about Obama. What transpired is, and we were accused of, especially I believe it was by the Attorney General of Hawaii that said that we never reached out to talk to him, and that is 100% true. The reason being, in the beginning, before we decided uh, to alert the sheriff that we believed we had a forgery, this was nothing more than inquisition. We were inquiring what happened here. Now that we had what we had and we presented it to the sheriff, it's now turned into a full-fledged law enforcement investigation. Now the steps to contact various agencies and request for help happens from this point under that authority. To do it before that would have had zero consequence. We would have gotten nothing out of it. A birth certificate is fraudulent. Sheriff Arpaio's investigation has already charged that. It's a law enforcement investigation. It's going to proceed. And as it does, more and more American people, of the American people are going to realize that Obama is lying about who he is and where he was born. There are no, I can't find a single document about Obama's past that's legitimate or not forged. It's a completely undocumented guy in the White House. Who is this guy? And why is he lying about who he is? I think these are the fundamental questions Americans are going to increasingly ask. The Selective Service card, we were put in the direction of that, and that's actually been out. For, for a while on, on websites and blog sites. People question the Selective Service card. The Selective Service card in and of itself, though, is problematic. It has a post office date stamp that uh, once it's received at the post office, it is date stamped to be canceled. In other words, it's been received. Um, the law back then in 1980, as put forth by, I believe, President Carter, was that any mail 18 to 26 was required by law to present themselves at a local post office, provide identification, fill out this card, and register for selective service. The card put forth uh, on the internet was actually acquired through a Freedom of Information Act request by a former INS ICE government agent. And that individual put that request forward, got a little bit of a runaround. For a little while there, nobody could find it then lo and behold, they find it. Sounds very familiar, like the birth certificate. Same story. They find it. About a 10-day span of time goes by from the time they announce that they find it to when they send this to him, and they forward him the card. When he gets the card, he takes a good look at it, and there's that date stamp. The only problem with the date stamp is it should have said, I believe it was July 29th, should have said 1980 on a Hawaiian postmark. Mr. Obama says July 29th, 8 zero. Looking at that stamp, it looks a little suspicious. We took the stamp to a number of retired post office workers. We took it to a couple retired postmaster generals, had them look at it. People that handle this stuff all the time and they also agreed it looks suspicious. 
Doing a little more investigative research, we actually determined the stamp that was used at the time. We actually acquired a stamp. We actually acquired some day stamps. What it looks like to us is a deviation from the policy set forth by the post office and DOD that the date stamp used would have been a PICA 40 date stamp. That date placard should have been one solid piece of rubber and a four digit year date, 1980. Mr. Obama's is an 80. Another FOIA request was put forth, and this time the request was to see other Selective Service cards from the same time period owned at one time or, or privileged to deceased individuals, so now FOIAable, they could be obtained. We got 16 of those, two of which were actually in the same post office almost days apart from Mr. Obama's. All of those other date stamps, no matter how they were stamped or how they were inked, all had four digit year stamps, 1980. Comparing those, it became evident to us that the 80 on Mr. Obama's didn't line up like the other ones. It was offset dramatically to the right and low to the right. Looking at that, we had, to make, we had to try to come to some kind of theory as to what happened here. And it became apparent to us that if you were going to manufacture this date stamp, it's very difficult to go back and find a 1980 date stamp. It's some 40 some odd years old. You would have to uh, literally either go back in time and hope some post office had one or wait to the year 2080 to get another 80. Well, that's a way off in the future. That's not going to happen. We believe what they did is they took a four-year date stamp, 2080 for 2008, severed it in between the two zeros, cutting it in the middle, and then inverting it. So instead of 08, it now looks like 80. They load that into the handle to stamp the document. What they didn't realize is if that date stamp isn't cut true, isn't cut square, when you load it into the handle, it pushes against the little compartment side it rides in and would offset far to the right. And if it was cut on an angle, it would offset far to the right and low. Well, I replicated that. And to my astonishment, I reproduced exactly what looks like Mr. Obama's date stamp. I, I actually gasped. I was like, oh my God, I produced this. This is what they did. Our contention is there is just no way, no logical reason that anyone in 1980, no post office employee, would have any reason, especially mid-year, to tamper with a four-year digit stamp. It sits in that handle for a year. Also on Mr. Obama's, you can see the circle of the seal is fully visible. It was pressed squarely down. I tried to rock it, move it, do whatever I could. You cannot get it to erase the four-digit date stamp. So our contention is that is another manufactured document. I've been looking for years for any airplane manifests or INS immigration cards that would document the period of time around August 1961 when Obama was supposedly born to see if the mother and baby had come into the United States from overseas after the baby was born. We finally got found these INS cards that people filled out when they got to the United States, both foreign nationals and U.S. citizens. And we're looking at the records coming in from the Pacific. Because I always thought it's possible that there may have been an Indonesian connection. There may be various reasons why, instead of returning through Idlewild, which, you know, would be more difficult to control in terms of larger setting, not Hawaii, the connections to wire, an entry of a baby back into the United States through Honolulu, may have been easier for a family trying to pull a fast one. And so the Pacific records uh, were very highly interesting to us. They were the only ones we had available at first. Now, you know, when we researched these, looking at them, the week of Obama's birth is missing. It's not there. And you start going through the records. This box says it's going to have the records through August 7th. Well, on August 2nd, there's no more records. And the, it's gone. And the uh, National Archives admitted they're gone. We, you know, they sent this to us in a letter. I have a, and they said, oh, well, maybe they got bunched up because of a machine malfaction. Well, this would have been hundreds of cards. There would have been a huge mess at the end of the file. The records are gone. And like so many, is a repeating pattern, so many of Obama's records, they're just missing. You know, the key facts about this guy's life 
are not available in documentary form. And the left can try to control all the narrative they want, but the truth is, and Alex Jones knows it, I know it, Alex's readers and listeners know it, this is a fundamental greatest cover-up in the history of American you know, politics, and that a lamestream media covers for Obama, refuses to participate in the investigation, and uses Saul Alinsky tactics to vilify anybody who dares ask these questions. I think the American people need to rise up and tell the media, we don't need you anymore. ABC, NBC, CBS, increasingly Fox. There is not another electronic file released of anyone else's birth certificate. I've had birth certificates sent to me from Hawaii. They are on paper. But I've had birth certificates sent to me from Hawaii that are not on green safety paper. They are just on white paper, a computer printout. And it's important for the public to understand that when Governor Amber Crombie went out and said that he was going to prove Barack Obama was born in Hawaii, he failed to locate the birth certificate. And that's puzzling to us because the Department of Health in 2001 went electronic on all their documents. In other words, they were all stored on computer. So the common logic would be if I needed to find a document, I call down there and I say, excuse me, I'd like to have Mr. Obama's birth certificate. You press the button and print it out. Obviously, that didn't happen. They didn't have it. They went on a search for it. He couldn't find it. He went to 30 some odd radio stations and said he couldn't find it. Then lo and behold, a document miraculously appears in a book, a bound volume of birth certificates from 1961 on a shelf with 499 other 1961 birth certificates. And the story goes that they broke protocol. They took the document, made two photocopies of it, and that's what they sent out to the President of the United States. Our contention would be is if that's all you did, we should have had a photocopy of this scanned into a JPEG file or even a PDF file for that matter and upload it to the White House and it should have just been a one-dimensional document. We believe it's manufactured to back up the story and give the impression that it was photocopied from a bound book. Um, I can't go into the particulars. We do have you know, uh, uh, forensic information to back that up. If this were in my jurisdiction, obviously you want to find the individuals responsible for it you would start the very last person that handled the document. It would be the person that uploaded it to the server that the White House released to the world. That would be the place you start, and you just simply work backwards from there. And how did you get it? How did you get it? How did you get it? And eventually you would find the person. That's provided there's cooperation. Um, what would normally happen in a situation like that is people will either speak or they will tell you they want an attorney, and they'll end it right there and then you have to find other means, other ways to do it. Um, in a utopian world in law enforcement, that's how I would like to do it. I'd like to interview everybody that ever came in contact with this document, or, and I'm not going to want to call it a document anymore, this file. It's, a, it's an electronic file. It is not a paper document. It's important to make that Very big distinction. This was put together so the public themselves, this was put together so someone would look at this on a computer screen and go, oh, that is what it's supposed to look like. It must be real. That's the deception in this. This isn't real. This will never be real. This is a fabrication. This is false. And that's the fraud that's not only committed here in Maricopa County, but it's the fraud that's been committed across the nation. And in addition, World Now Daily also reported that $1.7 million has been spent by the Obama law team in the last few years in order to block any access to any ID records, those specifically those pertaining to Occidental College and Columbia University. The Perkins Coy Law Firm, which is in Seattle, Obama had been using Bob Bauer to be his counsel on all these challenges to his eligibility even before the 2008 election. And we determined the amount of money over a million dollars by just looking at the FEC filing reports from the Obama campaign to Perkins Coy. Then Obama moved uh, Bauer inside the White House and made him White House special counsel and still kept using Bauer on a litigation involving eligibility cases. And by the way, Bauer is married to Anita Dunn, who is the attack dog on Fox. 
So you now have got a husband-wife defense attack dog team in Bauer and, you know, his, and Dunn. Again, leftist-oriented, nothing here to see, Saul Alinsky techniques, don't tell the truth because they can't afford to tell the truth. And then this bogus birth certificate gets wheeled out on April 27th and Bauer resigns. Well, I think, you know, Bauer resigned, and I've maintained this from the beginning, because Bauer finally looked at the tricks the White House was pulling, sees this bogus birth certificate come forth, and decides he's going to lose his law license if he stays on the case. Withdraws, goes back to Seattle, and says to his buddy Obama, you're on your own now with this computer-generated fraud. Well, pinning the language is really important, because if this were to be a physical document, if it started its life as a physical document, in other words, in the Department of Hawaii, they have this exact document in paper form, then obtaining that document would be very, very important to an investigation. Because once we got that document, then we can send that document to forensic document examiners to look at signatures, look at ink, look at some things on the document. The fact that it's digital means we are working with a file. There is no piece of paper for us to touch. And it becomes very difficult in an investigation when you don't have the original, quote, document, because it hampers the investigation and it hampers forensic experts from rendering opinions. To my understanding, if there is a hard copy document, no one other than select individuals from the state of Hawaii profess to have seen it. Um, the state of Hawaii has some very stringent laws when it, regarding vital statistics. And the only way that we would have an ability to see it would be to go to that state and request through court order the ability to see it. And even if we were granted permission to see it by a court, even by directive, the Department of Health in Hawaii could maintain the position of retaining the privilege not to produce it. And that's happened in some other court cases and unrelated incidents of other birth certificates where they just refuse to produce the document. As far as our position, a hard copy paper document is not something we want to see. I can make this into a hard copy. What the public has to understand is this becomes a hard copy at the press of a print button. Sheriff Opayo has decided that this will be an ongoing investigation. He's giving me no indication that this will stop anytime soon. As a matter of fact, something about the sheriff. The sheriff has been a law enforcement officer for 51 years, as long as I've been alive. He knows when it doesn't look right. He knows when it doesn't smell right. He's given us full authority to continue on, and he wants us to. I don't see it stopping anytime soon. And what's really clear right now, after we've sat and spoke to Mike Zullo from the Cold Case Posse's investigation team, is that they have an actual case here. And right now, legislation is in committee in the Arizona Congress to pass a bill that will put the president's eligibility right on the forefront. In other words, he will need to prove his eligibility beyond a shadow of a doubt in the state of Arizona if he is to be on the ballot in the election come November. And that legislation is currently being held up by Senator Bartow in Arizona. Uh, a strong majority of both chambers support this legislation. What I'm really disappointed with is apparently the gamesmanship being played by Senator Nancy Bartow. I, I, like I said before, we got two things down here, our word and our vote, and both are easy to lose if you're not careful. And when I speak directly with people like Nancy Bartow, who tells me that she's going to withdraw from the committee, when I get a copy of the memo and I give it to the leadership and they tell me it's fine and it'll move along, and it's not moving along, and I have no reason, no one tells me why, and then I hear some comments from the press that allegedly I'm supposed to do this mythical laundry list and have autographs on it that's not even in the rules. So it's a surprising to me that somebody in leadership with, with mass support of the caucuses, both caucuses, would, would play games with a bill and make me comply with a rule that doesn't exist. You know, it's unfortunate that we have to put a bill like this uh, forward, but we really need to make sure that people are who they say they are and that they qualify and pre-qualify for elected office. And, but the thing that I like the most about this is that it gives standing to the individual citizen to challenge a public official if they 
are found to be um, uh, out of integrity, really, as far as what their qualifications are to be an elected official. And of course, one of the you know you've got age, you have citizenship, you have a number of different areas where we look at qualifications. So Arizona is at the forefront of this battle between the federal government and the state's ability to govern their own affairs. Certainly, appearing on the ballot in a presidential election is a state's prerogative. All the legislation does, again, is just give average citizens the ability to hold all public it's, officials it's, in the uh, state accountable. If a, if a candidate on the ballot is not qualified, the citizen should have the ability to challenge that and question that. Right now, under current law, they do not. This bill would give them the clear legal authority to challenge or question any candidate on the ballot, and obviously the most important candidate, the president for the United States. This whole idea that it's a you know right wing attack on Obama, more Saul Alinsky nonsense and vilification, left trying to get the narrative under control, because the left has got to say, you know, they got left has got to be Baghdad Bob, they got to say there's nothing here to see move on. There's nothing here to see. Or anybody who's raising any questions about Obama's birth certificate, you got to be a lunatic. I'm sorry, anybody who believes that Obama's established that he's born in Hawaii, or any other fact about his life, including that he was never a foreign student, just hasn't looked at the record. And when you look at the record, this guy is undocumented. We've run into some roadblocks. The government has flagged his social security number. It's almost impossible to run on databases now. Even on civilian private investigator databases, they've been locked out. So we have an obstacle there we'll have to try to overcome. We cannot come up with any information that says the president ever resided in Connecticut. I don't understand how a high school junior, I guess, at the time, would have traveled all the way there to Connecticut to get one from Hawaii when you could just went to Hawaii and social security and applied for one. Um, it's normally the, uh, the state where you were born. For instance, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska. I've got 033. This is Nebraska Social Security number. It also goes by where the post office mark is that you register. In other words, the mailing address. So if you mailed it to an address, if you instructed them to mail it to an address in Connecticut to receive it, that could be where they put it as well. We, we found that out. But there isn't any evidence to say he was there at that time. And he's offered no explanation for it. Um, Madeline Dunham, Dunham worked for a bank. What her relationship was with the CIA, nobody knows. Uh, Anne Dunham, the, the daughter, when she was in Indonesia, ends up working for the Ford Foundation and Timothy Geithner's father, and then U.S. aid. Well, in these years, when she was in Indonesia that we know of for certain, I mean, even just taking the period of time of you know, 1967 through 1971, when Obama was six to ten years old. Well, that was a very turbulent time in the history of Indonesia. Most likely anyone who was involved in USAID would have had some association, like Ann Dunham, with the CIA. Uh, Barack Obama, out, coming out of Columbia, works for a newsletter company in New York City that is well established to be a CIA front. Now, that again does not mean Obama was CIA. We don't know. We don't have any of the documents about Obama. He won't release his life history. We don't know his full work history or employment history. Um, in terms of the natural born citizen issue, the very fact that Obama's father was a Kenyan should have disqualified Obama because it would mean that Obama was a dual citizen at birth, a citizen of the Commonwealth of Great Britain and a citizen, you know, through his father, through Kenya. Kenya was a Commonwealth country. And Obama would have been then combined, you know, dual citizen, U.S. citizen through his mother, possibly. Maybe even that's in question. But at any rate, a dual citizen, by definition, is not a natural-born citizen, especially not somebody of Great Britain. This is what the founders wanted to prevent. They wanted to prevent someone who had nationality ties to another country from assuming the highest position in the land, highest government position in the president. And especially nationality ties to Great Britain. They're very afraid that through the back door 
you know, a, a, a British citizen or someone who was a dual citizen with Great Britain or had been a citizen of Great Britain would become the President of the United States and would have a, an allegiance to the Great Britain that we had just fought a revolution to separate from. Woodrow Wilson. Well, the, the, well Woodrow Wilson it, it didn't really have the birth conflicts or issues of natural born. But the problem we have here is that, you know, if we don't take seriously the issue of Article 2, Section 1, that our Founding Fathers put that into the Constitution consciously because they wanted this purity of birth allegiance to the United States in order to be president, that they created a higher standard than citizen or native-born citizen or qualified to be citizen at birth. You know, they wanted it to be a person whose parents, both parents, were citizens when they were born and who was born in the United States. They did this to the, you know, the current left who's, you know, in love with diversity and we're all citizens of the world, you know, uh, kumbaya. It makes no sense to have these nation-state identifications. To those of us who value country and, you know, our uh, feel patriotic towards the United States and our history, feel an exceptionalism to this nation, feel an allegiance to the Founding Fathers, abandoning this principle is a foolhardy and, and you can't just throw away provisions of the Constitution that you don't like. The Constitution has provisions for amending it. There have been numerous attempts to amend this provision. They've all failed. Well, there's never been a case that has been on point for Article 2, Section 1, determining the eligibility of the president. Uh, I think the 1874-1875 case, Minor v. Happer said, is the really only definitional case where the Supreme Court made it clear that natural born uh, means two parents who are U.S. citizens at the time the person's born and born in the United States. Now, of course, by the time you get finished listening to Obama supporters, natural born means native born. They try to read the 14th Amendment into it. They read this you know, English common law into it. They refer to cases um, like this, uh, you know, various cases, Wong Kim Ark case that you know, really is not again on point by a judge who was appointed by Chester Arthur who himself lied about his eligibility. So the point is, you know, the left would like it to be anybody can, you know, baby f from birth tourism comes in from Turkey. Parents get the child born. They go back to Turkey, raise the kid. And the kid comes into the United States, lives enough years in the United States to qualify for the residence requirement, gets to be 35 years old, doesn't speak a word of English. The left says, hey, natural born citizen as he was born in the United States. I think commenting on, on Mr. Breitbart is really Mr. Corsi. He, he knows that situation better. The one thing I will say to you, though, I am curious. What Mr. Breitbart said at CPAC as to the videotapes he was in possession of, what was released pale in comparison to those statements. Mr. Breitbart made it really clear of who was going to be on those videotapes and what was going to be said, and we haven't seen them yet. I am highly suspicious of that. I had great affection for Andrew Breitbart, and I had tremendous admiration. You know, I spoke to Andrew, Andrew even at CPAC and told him the work we were doing with Sheriff Arpaio. So his, his loss, his, his death, is not only untimely, it, it's a great tragedy in terms of the uh, investigative capabilities he had and the contribution he was making to America. Um, I want to see the autopsy. I know the family is convinced it was natural causes. Family doesn't want undue suspicion generated, and I, I'm going to respect the wishes of the family, but I'm going to take a serious look at the autopsy results, and if there's nothing there, then fine, we'll respect the wishes of the family. But of course, I think, you know, the loss at the time, Andrew's saying he was going to make these revelations, is going to raise suspicion, and I'm not going to fan the suspicion until I've got more concrete reason to do so. Proof. I want proof. Intentionally, there's no answers. So with the demise of the United States, the constant efforts Obama's taken to weaken and destroy the United States, things I predicted he would do when I wrote The Abomination. You know, the, uh, the book 
Where's the birth certificate's never been more relevant. Go read it now. You'll see the questions that are being pursued and posed there are being pursued by our Piles investigation as well. We just did the story on the postman, the postman who delivered mail to the Ayers and said that Mrs. Ayers said that the Ayers family was paying for Barack Obama's tuition at Harvard as a foreign student. I mean, the postman saw Obama, connected Obama with this story. Well, let's see Obama's registration at all these schools. Was he a foreign student? You know, who paid for Obama's education? And this documents Ayers' involvement and the family's involvement with Obama at a much earlier age. A relationship. They paid for the education. Why? Does this explain why Bill Ayers may have had such an interest even to writing, perhaps, Obama's dreams for my father? These questions are deepening now. They're not going away. They're deepening and they're going to demand answer before the election. This is an issue that could affect every voter in Maricopa County. It is a fraud investigation. Um, and we have every right now to pursue this to verify the identity of the individual who wishes to be on the ballot. It's as simple as that. Opponents of this particular effort by Sheriff Joe Arpaio in Maricopa County should be under no illusion and not to underestimate the cold case posse team who are both serious and very capable of getting results in the investigation. They've gotten a number of results already and they will continue to bring home results as time goes by. And as Joe Arpaio told us, that this investigation is not going to end tomorrow, it's not going to end next week, and it's not going to end likely next month. This is an ongoing effort because the people of Arizona have given him that authority to find the truth. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds? Go to InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv for the latest headlines and cutting-edge information.